Thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, today's my birthday. This is how national security wonks spend their birthdays. Talking to the chief of naval operations, I can't think of a better way. <laughs> oh, the pleasure's all mine. I hope it's worth it. Well, the, the, it does give me extra leeway with difficult questions, right? Is that, <laughs> Absolutely. Is that free for, reign? You get a couple okay. extra. All right. So let's start with Donald Trump and his positions. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> um, you, uh, you know, I was reading through um, what is in effect your your plan, right? I mean, for, for, for the Navy and maintaining sea superior, maritime superiority uh, for decades to come. And you, like, for instance, whenever I speak to intel officials, you, you name Russia and China at the top of your list of, of strategic challenges going forward, uh, just in terms of potential adversaries. Um, I wonder if we could start with Russia then, uh, as, as someone with a little bit of experience on submarines, um, Russia's increased activity all around, certainly in the air, but at sea and under the sea. Um, what is it up to? What do you think its objective is as it pushes the limits? Yeah, well, just to uh, kind of fall, you know, fall in on your question a little mm -hmm. bit, um, the activity has been brisk you know, from Russia at sea and in other places, as you know. And uh, what we're seeing is activities levels at sea that we haven't seen since the mid-1990s. Uh, that's both on the sea and under the sea and, and over the sea. And uh, it seems that, uh, you know, of course, uh, I'm just giving you my best guess, but certainly they have demonstrated a lot of sort of new technologies, you know, for the first time. And so uh, with respect to their undersea capabilities, um, you know, we've seen them launch cruise missiles from submarines and into Syria. Uh, we've seen them not only stand up and test, but deploy, now start to deploy their new class of SSBNs, the Dolgoruki class. Uh, they've got a guided missile submarine that's coming online. And so, you know, they, as they reconstitute their undersea forces with a new generation of technology, they're getting those out and they're using them. You've seen them shoot, uh, you know, long-range land attack cruise missiles from the Caspian Sea. And so, you know, they're, they're really getting a uh, chance to try out all these new technologies to field test them, if you will. And then uh, they've clearly, they're back in the Middle East in a, in a ma major way. And so, you know, just as a start, it seems like if you were thinking about two goals, uh, those are two pretty important goals that they're, they're taking a swing at. So Syria, uh, testing new technologies, but, but particularly up in the North Sea, testing NATO's response, right? I mean, is, is it your view that the objective here, um, coupled with activity in Ukraine and elsewhere, is it to undermine NATO? You know, I think that there's a dimension of that. Mm -hmm. uh, really, it's, it's to, uh, and it's always a contest, I guess, right? And so, you know, as this pitches back and forth, uh, what uh, we've seen is that uh, in a number of contexts, but, but for both Russia and China, they seem to have found a way to move this competition forward in a manner that is just below sort of the traditional levels of conflict and mm. achieve progress there in ways that you know, are non-traditional, below the thresholds of what you might want to call a, you know, a kinetic response. And, so I think that's an area where we've got to be very creative in terms of how we move forward. You know, it's discussed in our, uh, in our plan. So what's, how, do you, how do you articulate the strategy for responding to that just below the threshold? Because you, as you know, there, there's a perception, I mean, you hear it in Europe, you hear it in the Middle East, you hear it in Asia, uh, that the U.S. is getting beat. You know, that China and Russia are successfully testing the limits and pushing the limits, and that the U.S either doesn't have the, um, you know, the backbone to respond or, or the strategy or, you know, is disengaged or doesn't want to get involved in another conflict. I mean, you've heard that perception. So yeah. has, how, how do you, can you articulate how the U.S. responds to that strategy from both Russia and China? Well, I think that a big part of our response would be to realize that this is not just military and not just U.S. Yeah. And so it's, it uh, seems that, th in particular, these types of challenges are open to sort of a whole government type of an approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that will include, you know, strengthening those regional security architectures, working with our partners, with our allies, to make sure that, you know, we 
we build up their resistance to these types of uh, behaviors so that you know that we're just not so susceptible to these types of activities. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to a, to, to a French diplomat, this is just a couple of weeks ago, and he was describing Putin as, as a gambler. And, and you'll often hear folks say that, well, he doesn't really have a strategy, he's, he's a tactical thinker, he's just kind of pushing here and there and pushing buttons. Uh, but this diplomat is a bit of a historian on, on Hitler, uh, and he, he made the comparison, not me, but, but he was saying that, you know, the Russians, t you know, make gambles and if one works, then they'll, they'll, they'll do the next one and, and kind of, you know, th then you begin to think, and he raised this, you begin to think sort of Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and at some point, you know, it's above the threshold. And I just wonder from your perspective, when you look at that adversary, are you concerned that, uh, particularly if they don't have a plan, that it could escalate beyond that threshold? Well, I think uh, we have to be careful not to oversimplify, you know, uh, any of our adversaries and, and dismiss them. Uh, you know, I think that in general they, they're rational actors from their perspective and what mm -hmm. they're doing you know, makes a lot of sense from their perspective. And so seeking to understand what that perspective might be, you know, that, that's where I think we need to, uh, to spend more effort. And then you know, it is always a gamble, isn't it? I mean, uh, none of the outcomes are, are uh, foregone conclusions when you're moving forward. Even some of the things that we would argue are some of our greatest successes, you know, in kind of uh, manifesting and bringing the Cold War to a close, mm. uh, you know, those were far from certain outcomes when we were going through them. And so there is this sort of element of uncertainty always. And it kind of goes to, you know, you said this is our plan for the next 10 years. Uh, it's really, you know, we use this word design on purpose, right? Because uh, as things accelerate, I think it's getting more and more challenging to see further and further into the future, mm. right? So I would say this is not a 10-year plan. Mm. Uh, you know, this is version 1.0 of a plan. We're going to do our best to characterize the environment. Uh, we're going to do our best to put a plan together. And then we're going to step forward. And the first thing you got to do is measure to see, are you having the effect that you designed, you know, that you intended? Uh, but just because it's, it's, move, it's very complex, it's moving very fast, and so you've got to be ready to adjust uh, either your understanding of the environment or your plan or even your goals as you step forward. So there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty and I think this kind of you know, measuring as you go and adapting as you go is fundamental to our use of the word design rather than plan. Mm. What, do you, what do you place the chances of war with Russia in the next 10 years? No, I think it's small. Yeah. Is it, you know, we, we can't, we come from... I want to be the world's expert at not going to war right. with Russia and right. China. Right. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about China then and the South China Sea and, and responding to its, its moves there. Um, I was lucky enough to get the, to fly over the man-made islands a year ago and, mm -hmm. and see just one, well, hear their response as the U.S. flies over there. Uh, they treat it like their own territory, right, mm -hmm. in their own airspace, but also see how quickly, and, and, and we know how quickly they built these spaces up. And since then, we've seen deployments of, you know, these mobile missile launchers, and, and you know, you've got a completed runway on some of them. Um, what is China's end game, in your view? Well, I think that's one of the issues, is that it's really hard to discern what that end game is. There's a mm -hmm. lot of opaqueness with respect to their intentions. And that's why you know, not only we, but a number of the uh, countries in that region are growing increasingly anxious yeah. about what is the intention. Uh, you know, we would continue to advocate and support what I would say is you know, an order right, uh, in that region of the world and around the globe, uh, an order, but an open architecture order right, that uh, gives everybody who wants to participate sort of as level a playing field to succeed as possible. And that's, you know, that system, which has essentially been in place for the last 70 years, has given many nations, including a lot in that region, you know, just great prosperity mm -hmm. over that period of time. And we would advocate that that's the way to go uh, going forward into the future. Um, you know, while it's hard to predict exactly what the intentions are, that's the hardest thing, right, is intentions. Um, it, it seems that uh, there, there may be sort of a tendency for an ordered, but maybe not so open an architecture, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of, sort of a closed order approach. 
Uh, you kind of come through, hey, we claim these areas. You come through uh, on our you know, permission, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we just want to continue to do those sorts of activities that advocate for this open architecture, level playing field approach. That's the set of global rules and norms that have been in place. And it's not just there. You know, it's important to keep in context, for instance, our freedom of navigation program. Mm -hmm. It's worldwide, right. you know, and, uh, but of course, uh, the South China Sea is getting a lot of attention right now. Is, is, it, <clears throat> is part of that uh, learning to live with China's new claims? I mean, you can still sail the ships, you could do the occasional freedom of navigation run, but at the end of the day, they have these unsinkable aircraft carriers, right, as people have called them, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the paracels and South China Sea, and, and you know, the fire, fire, fire cross reef, all, all those places, they, they have them already, and they, yeah. don't, they, don't, they don't seem to be going anywhere. Well, they're not going to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, so we've got to live with them, right? <laughs> yeah, you do, and, but, uh, you know, how, how that proceeds going forward, you know, what are the, what is the rule set that governs mm -hmm. behaviors in that part of the world? You know, that's where I think we have to, uh, I mean, certainly, you, you know, China's a growing nation, very complex nation, and uh, <clears throat> we want to get to an end state where it is open architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody's got a, a chance to compete uh, and do everything we can to avoid conflict right. as we, you know, exercise that competition. So. How, how, part of your design <laughs> speaks about the, the, the freedom to some degree that, that, that commanders have uh, when deployed to, right. to, to make decisions. And you, you have multiple scenarios here where a commander can find himself in a, in a situation. If, if China, for instance, decides to head off a freedom of navigation operation, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, what do, you tell, what do you tell them to do? Yeah, well, uh, the idea is that uh, we give them commander's intent uh, but we also understand that nobody's going to you know, get the full essence of that situation better than that commander who's on that ship exercising that operation. And so what this uh, requires really is you know, a lot of conversations, to be honest, uh, between commanders and their subordinates to make sure they understand sort of uh, what the full intent is, how you would respond or how, how one should react uh, in the face of kind of any unanticipated situation, right? We're never gonna be able to cover every contingency. So it's very uh, important that you understand the risk calculus that's in play. Mm -hmm. And then you have to delegate to that commander and expect them to do the right thing. Right. Right. You know, enhancing that too, we've been working uh, uh, very closely with the Chinese and other nations in that region to, uh, to establish a rule set, right, for encounters at sea, encounters in the air. Mm -hmm. And we've been seeing increased uh, you know, cooperation, increased use of that rule set. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we'll, we'll continue to advocate. Again, going back to the sort of rules-based approach, right. you've got these pre-planned responses for these unplanned encounters at sea. And uh, you know, by and large, there's more and more abiding by that rule set as we go forward. So Th things like bridge-to-bridge -bridge communications, you mean? Bridge-to-bridge -bridge communications, how what, you know, we should maneuver, you mm -hmm. know, just how we should set up these encounters so that mm -hmm. we don't have something unexpected happen. Uh, as well, you know, I've got a good communication with my counterpart. Uh, I think that those are very important so that in the event something happens that raises some questions, we can get in touch with one another and I think that those are very important to prevent sort of unanticipated or unwanted escalations. Oftentimes, w when there's greater domestic instability, that increases the risk of digging in their heels, right, to some degree. I mean, is there, as you watch China's own domestic issues, you know, the economy, et cetera, in, that, in your view, does that increase the risk of a confrontation? Yeah, it's hard to uh, determine. I mean, uh, certainly, uh, th they've got a lot on their plate. Uh, how all of this figures in, I think, is uh, an important part of that. But I would always advocate that it's our job to open up decision space for our leaders. Uh, we do that by behaving predictably in a de-escalatory fashion. Right. And so, uh, you know, as I, as I talk to my counterparts around the world, that's sort of what I'm advocating for. We escalate, it, it tends to collapse decision space, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And force us down yep. into something. That's not our job. Our job is to provide our leadership with more credible options, not fewer. Okay. Uh, two other countries you mentioned, not surprising, Iran and North Korea. So North Korea is a country 
you know, it doesn't have the naval presence, it certainly has a growing missile capability. You certainly don't have the kind of communication you have with the, with the Chinese. What, what is your level of concern as North Korea becomes more emboldened and you begin to worry that, you know, under this nuclear umbrella that then their conventional operations could become more aggressive? Yeah. Uh, what's your level of concern with North Korea? No, I think everybody who's involved with that uh, has a high level of concern just because of the unpredictability involved and combine that with the capabilities that they've demonstrated makes for a very, very volatile situation. Uh, and the only thing that seems to be predictable is that you know, they will be sort of very provocative, right? And so uh, this is, again, you know, the work of General Scaparotti, Admiral Harris. You know, they've got to kind of maintain that level of alertness. Certainly, you know, the response times are very short in some of the scenarios there. But they've also got to maintain, you know, a little bit of uh, time to reflect and, you know, calm things down. It's, mm -hmm. that, that's a tough problem in terms of just the time frames involved. Can, can the North Koreans launch, I mean, they, they've demonstrated or the, uh, capability to launch missiles from a sub. I mean, where, how close are we to a nuclear-capable North Korea uh, in terms of miniaturize? I mean, I, I know the, the, the intel view is that we have to assume that they've already been able to miniaturize, but... But when does North Korea, in your view, become a fully nuclear-capable <coughs> threat? Well, you know, they've, they're working on the submarine, um, yeah. and, you know, we're watching that closely. Certainly, they've got uh, land-based, you know, types of options as mm -hmm. well. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to put a timeline on these things just because there's a tremendous amount of op opacity yeah. there. So. But so you have to sort of bias towards the conservative. But it seems that the U.S. is just waiting for that possibility, right? And, and gonna, like another one that it's going to decide it has to live with. Well, um, we're certainly working a lot with our, you know, partners and 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 mm -hmm. others in the area to kind of bring to bear as much pressure on that situation as we can. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, Iran. I mean, what's the function of of the various provocations we've seen recently? I mean, the ballistic missiles is one thing, but firing off the rockets by, by, by U.S. warships. It, you know, some of this is predictable, but do you, you know, post-nuclear deal, do you find Iran emboldened, perhaps, or, or less of a threat, you know, particularly just to U.S. ships operating in the Gulf? I think that with respect to what we do in the Gulf, mm -hmm. uh, really nothing has changed by virtue of this agreement, except mm -hmm. that we can be more confident that a nuclear type of a capability is mm -hmm you know, off the table for now. Uh, but it, it, their, their biggest ally is the geography there, right? Yeah. And it's, everything is in such close quarters. And so I just came back from that uh, theater and, you know, they remain as alert as ever. Not, mm -hmm. You know, our job in that part of the world has not really changed. And uh, so, so we're watching it very closely. Um, you know, the, the Iranian activity of that type sort of ebbs and flows over time and we're not seeing anything tremendously out of that normal kind of ebb and flow right now. I see. Um, can you talk at all about the sailors and their, their getting too close and their capture? I mean, we, we, we've seen, and we have some reporting on the results of the, you know, the investigation, the after investigation, but, but was this purely the sailors' mistake? Yeah, I think that uh, to get into those types of details would be premature right now. The investigating officer is pretty much finished with his work and now it's in review. And you know how those reviews go. There's always, hey, you know, sure. what about this? What about this? And so, uh, you know, we're in that process right now. It's a very complicated investigation, as you can imagine, hundreds of interviews. And it's gonna take us a little bit of time to uh, get through all that to make sure we've got, you know, a complete picture. So when okay. we start talking, I wanna be it's as true. confident I as we I understand. Well, let me just ask you this then. Yeah. How nervous were you when you got the call that, that these sailors had been captured? Nervous. Yeah. But, you know, on the good side, uh, it was resolved pretty quickly, mm -hmm. right? So 16 hours, we had them back. And so you know, very grateful for uh, everybody's efforts, Secretary Kerry and everybody mm -hmm. who was involved in getting them back. Have you met with them since with, then? With, with the, the sailors? sailors? No, I haven't had a chance to meet them. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you a political question, oh. and I know I, I, I'm, I, I can assume you won't answer, but I just have to ask you as a military man who served for the number of years that you have, and I know to some degree the way the military or military options are talked about in any political campaign, invariably, they're, 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 you know, it can get off the rails, but this time 
by any stretch of the imagination, it's more so. Um, things like telling soldiers to, to disobey the law, just, you know, talking about carpet bombing, that kind of thing. As a military man, do you, do, do you look at that with any, I won't say alarm is too strong a word, but, but does it upset you to hear that kind of talk? Well, I think it's our job, no matter who uh, becomes the commander in chief, mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, we are you know, thoughtful, certainly, and that uh, we provide the absolute you know, best advice that we can mm -hmm. with respect to the employment of the military element of national power. And so uh, just by virtue of whatever personal experience the different candidates may have, they may have uh, more or less familiarity with what that entails. And so, you know, I think uh, myself and a lot of others are giving a lot of thought in terms of how to couch that advice. Uh, you know, what are the, gonna be those initial briefs to make sure that uh, you know, we're best postured to provide that advice. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the virtues of our system is that you get this sort of peaceful transfer of power. Mm -hmm. You get a military that's controlled by, you know, civilians and, and that'll be the way it is going forward, so. Okay. Um, one final question for me, because I want to allow. Uh, so for, you know, first I got to just go, stop. Go so it's the future of war, uh -huh. and we're getting into all this political question. Uh, just <laughs> one, just one. And I know it's your birthday, but and then you, you put me after the cyber rifle guy, which I don't know how I'm supposed to compete with that. And so uh, and I'm starting to feel a little bit. You now bring I'm a toy to get nervous. next time, you know. Where it's defense. You know, these guys love toys. Um, one big picture question before we go to the audience, and that is, you know, a lot of the trends you talk about in here, you know, just the proliferation of technology, how quick technology is changing, a lot of this feeds, you know, the, the asymmetric nature of warfare. And, yeah. and, and, and the, you know, folks that can, you know, countries, and they, they think about, they strategize about neutralizing American military advantages, you know, particularly you know, when we talk about naval advantage. Sure. Russia, certainly China, that's part of their whole strategy. Big picture, is, is the U.S. keeping up with that fast enough? <laughs> to maintain superiority, maritime yeah, superiority. I, I would say uh, the big message out of you know this design is it not only talks about the competitors, and we've spent a fair time this, the, today talking about the competitors in in the contest, but the the character of the contest has changed, mm -hmm. and so you know the it, and the biggest change I think is pace, right? Mm -hmm. The rate at which things are changing. And uh, while we still enjoy a margin of superior, superiority right now, uh, I would argue that if we don't pick up the pace, mm -hmm. we will certainly not meet our potential, uh, and worse, may fall behind our competitors. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we've got a lot of things that uh, we're doing to try and increase the pace at which we develop concepts, increase mm -hmm. the pace at which we uh, bring in new technologies, and you know, there's a real harmony that can be developed if you do it right between concept development and technology mm -hmm. development. One sort of feeds the other, you know, when you get right. it going just right. And so uh, there is this idea of pacing. The other idea is that, uh, you know, resources for the foreseeable future are going to be about flat, if not declining. Mm -hmm. uh, that would, you know, we, we would be, I think, overly optimistic if we didn't at least plan for that, uh, that contingency. So how do you, you know, get out? You've got a more complicated security environment in terms of the character of it. You've got more competitors in the, in the contest. Uh, there is this, also this element of not only going, you know, speeding up the pace, but also looking to combine things in new and creative ways. And, uh, you know, there's a good rich history uh, in, uh, in military history of not necessarily the new piece of technology, but combining that creatively with another piece of existing technology. And that type of, those types of combinations can make all the difference. And you know, most of the time people talk about technology kind of approaching an exponential curve, mm -hmm. uh, but these combinatorics can even beat that if it's done cleverly. And so in terms of achieving your potential, improving your performance, it's a combination of picking up the speed for, cer for certain, but mm -hmm. also combining things in, in more creative ways. Gotcha. All right, um, I wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions, and we got 15 minutes. So uh, just open up to the audience, and I think, I imagine there are microphones as well. Gentleman on the right-hand side. 
Steve Winters, uh, independent uh, consultant. Well, thank you so much uh, for the talk. I, I, this is a small question, but I've heard so much about the uh, third offset strategy. I've mm. heard uh, Secretary Hagel talk about how he uh, initiated uh, those ideas a few years ago, and then I've heard, uh, I guess, Deputy Secretary Work explain it. That was so <laughs> impressive. But uh, I, I just wonder, in terms of calling it an offset strategy, when I uh, read the uh, the Russians uh, are Putin uh, describing his attempts to uh, jumpstart technology, and he has a whole uh, list of uh, critical technologies for military that they're pushing development on. Uh, I, I, it seems to me that both uh, the, the Russians and ourselves are essentially doing the same thing. So to call it an offset strategy, uh, we're not offsetting the Russians. We're competing with the Russians in the same idea. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, I think what you're talking about is uh, sort of the fundamental nature of this contest, right? So this is a contest between two thinking adversaries that are both trying to outwit the other. And so we should not be surprised that, uh, you know, they've got their plan. They want to checkmate us even as we're trying to checkmate them. And so, uh, you know, too often you, you mentioned, hey, there's, there's these technologies out there that may be rendering our military irrelevant. Well, certainly, of course, they're going to target our vulnerabilities. We would be shocked if they did anything differently, right? Uh, but it's not just a one-way game, right? Uh, so as they are uh, executing their strategy, we are executing ours. And so it's this back and forth. And I, I think, you know, there's nothing new about that that's fundamental to the nature of the contest. Folks uh, in the middle here. National Security Project and wanted to ask the question as a submarine officer, what is your thought about the future of aircraft carriers? And mm -hmm. talking about how this is, uh, the SECNAV has put out there saying that the Ford class may be the last type of its class where we have manned aircraft and large aircraft carriers as the Ford is being designed. What do you see as the vision for the next level of aircraft carriers and, and air warfare yeah. in the Navy? Yeah, well, uh, that's a giant question. And I think the secretary said that uh, the Joint Strike Fighter might be the last manned aircraft of its type that we send, uh, just to be you know, a little bit precise there. And uh, I think that this is one area where we'll just have to see where the technology takes us, right? I'm not, right now, I'm not ready to bet 100% that we're going to get there by the next generation. We've just started those studies to see what will be the next thing uh, in terms of uh, achieving air dominance. Um, <coughs> excuse me. What I want to do, though, now, with respect to just the uh, aviation piece, is get going, right? I, I, we, we've sort of thought about this long enough, and I want to get an unmanned aircraft on the deck of the carrier, and it's got a legitimate mission, right? It's not just a prototype out there. Uh, so for ISR and tanking, uh, those are things that will make a legitimate contribution to the air wing. And we will learn so much about what it takes to integrate unmanned into the air wing. And uh, so that's kind of one effort, just the operational effort. And then in parallel, you know, we're watching the technology and more than watching, participating in developing the technology. And, and so we will migrate that over as it matures uh, to make sure that this aircraft continues to improve in capability as the technology, uh, you know, matures and, and allows us to do that. Uh, the learning cycle, I want to be very, very short, right? So we'll get out there now with something and we'll start learning. As technology becomes available, we'll, we'll incorporate that and we'll learn again. You know, I don't want to try and predict 10, 20 years from now what will be the, the right answer because uh, it's just becoming amazingly hard to predict 20 years into the future right now. And so, uh, you know, the answer to that for me is having shorter learning cycles so that we can follow that uh, potential curve a lot more closely. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the aircraft carrier itself, uh, you know, there's a number of studies that we have going on right now to look at how that all you know, should, should be going forward. And uh, I'm eager to see what the results of those are. We'll go where the data takes us, and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Anne Marie. Uh, 
Thank you, Admiral Richardson. Thanks so much for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just have to tell you, you're, you're all over Twitter. You may, yeah. <laughs> there's mm -hmm. this conference, and uh, then there's those of us mm -hmm. who are on Twitter, and uh, it's a parallel uh, conference. <laughs> that just really scares me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so as, uh, and I have to say, it's something to, to hear uh, uh, the CNO sounding like a, uh, the, uh, owner, the, an entrepreneur with a lean startup, because right. your language is very much the lean startup. But you just mentioned something about you know checkmate, and, and we think about checkmating them, and they think about checkmating us, and that's the traditional chessboard strategy of great power war. Mm. But we heard uh, Suzanne Spaulding yesterday, undersecretary for DHS, talk about a network strategy yeah. and building a network of networks uh, and how you do that. We were talking about cybersecurity so that, you know, anytime there's a, any attack anywhere in the network, the entire network uh, knows what that is. And right. I just wondered if you're, if you could talk to us a little bit about the way you're also thinking in network terms, which Certainly. is really quite different than the sort of traditional chessboard. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and, you know, there's, there's also the, the crowd that says, hey, that's very Western to think of chess, but you know, in the Eastern mm -hmm. context, we're thinking about Go, right? right so, right. and uh, I also note that a computer just beat the uh, Go champion. Yeah. So, you know, it is a rules-based uh, structure at right. the end of the day, uh, and we're getting better at uh, figuring that rule set out. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, we have a number of efforts going on right now that I'm looking at integrating. Uh, one goes by the name of distributed lethality. Uh, so we've got some things going on in that direction, and that's sort of how to stitch in surface forces in more creative ways. Um, we have uh, another, it's sort of integrated fire control dash counter air, NIFCA, if you uh, are an acronym uh, person. Uh, and so that's you know, how to integrate uh, in the naval aviation context. Uh, I, I zoom out from that and I see you know, a space where it is a kind of a network of networks where the any one of our sensors uh, can share its data to the highest level of precision, right? Targeting data, if, if uh, need be, with any one of our platforms, which carries you know a host of, I would say, payloads, right? Uh, weapons and electromagnetic warfare and cyber effects. And so, if you think of that space, you know these axes of sensors and and uh, platforms and payloads. Uh, you know, wherever you can connect those, you start to build a network of networks. And that, I think, becomes not fragile, but actually resilient, right? So if a particular option goes down, well, you've got a number of other options that can, that can come up and, and you, you get this sort of graceful degradation and restoration going on. And so that's where I'm trying to, uh, to move. Uh, and, you know, it's very complex when you get to that level. Uh, and so, you know, some of these technologies that are right around the corner, artificial intelligence, the types of computers that, that beat uh, Kasparov in chess and beat the Go champion, you know, how can they help us think through these types of uh, decision, you know, matrices that will accompany that, making sure that we've got people inserted at the appropriate place to, to control the risk there, so. You, you may just follow there, because you mentioned you want to get unmanned aircraft uh, deployed. You mentioned elect electromagnetic. I mean, how soon before you have a deployed uh, railgun? Yeah, well, this railgun thing, yeah. I need to. Uh... Is that uh, <laughs> Star Wars? Or is it... <laughs> no, it's not Star Wars. Yeah, we're we're down to kind of engineering in right. the railgun, and so it's we're, we're moved beyond the science part. But I got to tell you, I'm uh, you know I'm impatient with respect to this directed energy, uh, mm. you know, vector that we need to uh, go down. Uh, the railgun. Once we get through these engineering challenges, it'll be kind of a, a magnificent mm -hmm. weapon. Uh, similarly with lasers and similarly with these other directed energy mm -hmm. types of, of things. And so we've got some movement in that in this budget, but I want to accelerate that mm -hmm. as much as we can. I, I think that's a big part of our future. Fantastic. Uh, gentleman here in the, in the front. Sarah Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. You know, one of the big complaints we're getting from the COCOMs is the lack of uh, submarines. You know, and obviously, you know, you, you're trying to build two uh, attack subs a year. Uh, would like to go more, but they're expensive. You are also got a plan to go, all, you know, unmanned undersea vehicles. How much of a of a role will those unmanned vehicles go to, uh, to closing the gap you have in in, uh, in attack boats out? Yeah. 
Well, I think that they you know they complement one another, right? And so uh, if you can see a uh, sort of a manned uh, platform, an attack submarine, for instance, uh, being you know the hub of sort of a family of under, underwater vehicles, some autonomous, some maybe tethered, some bigger that would have deployable payloads off of them, uh, longer range. Uh, you, you can see that a single manned submarine would extend its influence quite a bit by virtue of doing something like that. And so there is this sort of complementary relationship that uh, happens. And so uh, you know, we've got a big push forward in unmanned both in the air and under sea. Uh, and on the surface, for, uh, for that matter, uh, in terms of you know, how do we extend our reach and how do we reduce our risk, uh, particularly to our sailors, uh, by doing those sorts of things. I think we're going to have time for a couple more questions. So just for geographic variety, I might go on the way back here. Sure, sir. Byron Cowan, Capital Alpha Partners. You talked about, about picking up the pace. I wonder if you can talk a bit more how you pick up that pace. Is it a resource issue? Is it a cultural issue? Do you have the authorities from Congress to do that? Uh, yes, yes, and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, what will, I'll just give you some examples of uh, some of the ideas that we're uh, pitching right now. <clears throat> um, one is this rapid prototyping and experimentation division. And so this would, be a team of technologists uh, with a broad you know, understanding of the portfolio, a broad spectrum of knowledge. And they would respond either to urgent needs from the combatant commander or even uh, maybe more uh, useful, looking for opportunities you know, that maybe haven't been articulated yet in order to further our way forward. And the idea is that uh, we bring together these relatively mature technologies. I don't want to be in the you know, the science uh, immature technology phase. And then again, you know, combine them in ways uh, that we can rapidly prototype. And you know, you run them through some in-house testing, and then as soon as possible, you get them out to the fleet, right? And that's when the magic happens. It, you know, there's nobody kind of more creative than the United States sailor. And he'll think of a thousand ways that you could make it better. If you only added this, could you just cut down on this? You get them talking with the engineers, and uh, and, and I think there's real potential there to come to some uh, really valuable solutions early on. You know, part of this, though, in terms of our culture, will be that some of those ideas are just not going to work out, right? And uh, we've got to understand that that's part of the business, you know, part of the model going forward. And as long as we can attach a lot of learning and lessons to that failure, uh, then you know that's that's a, a success, right? A failure is not even the word for it, I don't think. And so, and, and I'd much rather learn that lesson early uh, when there's relatively little value in the, uh, in the program, right? I haven't integrated and built it and deployed it and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'll pick up confidence as I go too, right? Because I'll have really wrung out all of the uh, issues with it so that when I do go to some kind of a formal production line, program of record, if you will, I'll have a lot more confidence that that solution's gonna withstand you know, the, the, the environment in which it's going. So we have this rapid prototyping and experiment effort going on to get started, right? And then uh, for those ideas and maybe other technologies that uh, would be appropriate for fast tracking into production, we're standing up what we're cleverly calling the Maritime Accelerated Capabilities Office, or MACO. And uh, these are, you know, uh, it's a fast track, if you will, uh, an HOV lane for everybody in this, uh, uh -huh. this audience that mm -hmm. understands exactly what I mean, mm -hmm. so that you can kind of go faster. And uh, you've got the uh, resident authorities in place that can make quick decisions. They can maybe adjust the, uh, the acquisition requirements because of the confidence that they have in, in the program and get things moving faster. So, and then, you know, the secret plan is to, over time, migrate more and more programs out into the fast lane, right? Lean them down so that they're more appropriate for the fast lane, and soon nobody will be left in the slow lane, so. But it's, you know, it's, you gotta think that through, right? You don't want that fast lane so close that it's not startlingly different, uh, but you don't want it too far out that it just sort of dies on the end of the yard arm and doesn't uh, flourish, and so how far off the main track do you position that? is uh, work going forward. 
Uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave it there. I will ask you how Navy football is going to do next year before I let you go. Well, you know, we had an awesome year. You did. Uh, you did. This last year. It's and uh, Keenan Reynolds, you mm -hmm. know, just a uh, real superstar. A lot of graduates. So, mm -hmm. But I've got a lot of faith in Coach Ken, and I'm looking forward to a great season. Great. Thanks. Admiral Richardson. All right. Thanks, thanks very much. much.